Before we get into today's episode, I just wanna let you guys know that we're at the height of the holiday season. Make sure you don't forget to treat yourself. So this season, make sure you pick up an Illuminati plush, an exclusive partnership with Makeship. It's a pre-order. It's only available for a couple weeks. It's ending very soon. So make sure to pick one up. Go to makeship.com, go to live campaigns, and you'll see the Illuminati plush sitting there. Very cute, very adorable, very pyramid. Also comes with a little teacup this year, which is a super cute bonus. Link will be in the description box. If you wanna get there a little easier, just boom, click that baby and off you go. Hope you guys love them. Do any of you have a grandmother that collects woven baskets? Well, there's an MLM for everything, even those. This MLM is actually one of my favorites, probably because I'm low-key obsessed with the massive basket-shaped building headquarters. But just how harmful could a basket MLM be? Well, in today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays, that's what we're going to find out. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Multi-Level Mondays. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be talking about an old MLM known as the Longa Burger Company. Now, this MLM has been around since the 70s and even though you might think that with a basket company like this, sales would be minimal, but at their peak, this MLM was making a billion dollars in sales. Apparently, Huns just love their baskets. Anyway, let's see what this basket company has in store for us today. We'll start as always with the history. According to the Prudent Collector, although the company wasn't founded until the 1970s, the company history really began in 1919 when J.W. Longaberger himself began working for the Dresden Basket Factory in Dresden, Ohio. He mastered the tight weaving skill of the Dresden baskets over time. Even after the company closed due to the Great Depression, he still continued making baskets in his spare time. In 1936, he and his wife, Bonnie Jean, accumulated enough money to buy the closed down Dresden factory, renaming it to the Ohio Ware Basket Company. And to be sure to reference the Ware Baskets in that Dresden company once sold, baskets specifically made for carrying pottery. However, the business closed around 1955, and it wasn't for almost 20 years that the family spark of making baskets reignited in JW and Bonnie's fifth son, Dave. In 1972, Dave Longaberger saw department stores selling imported baskets and figured, hey, his father was an excellent basket maker. Maybe they could take advantage of the trend. He asked his father to make a dozen baskets to dip his toes into the water, and after selling them all rather quickly, asked for 10 dozen to sell. The next year in 1973, it had become a small business that though it originally was called the JW Handwoven Baskets, it soon became the Longa Burger Company. The first few years the company did business, they seemed to have a traditional business model in place. And that's at least what sources seem to imply. I've of course got no issues with a family business selling hand baskets. I think the history with basket weaving is endearing actually. Given that wicker items and the sort of handwoven style went through a revival around this time, it seemed like the Longa Burger Company was absolutely destined to succeed. However, for whatever reason, David changed things. I'm not entirely sure why he chose to switch to an MLM business model, but it, it, it's the fact that he did. The Prudent Collector claims that David had been inspired by home shows hosted by sales consultants like a home shopping network. And it was something that he saw as massively important to the brand because consultants would be able to explain the history and craftsmanship of their products, both of which are massively important to Longa Burger as a brand. The thing is, if telling their story was truly important, I feel that there are a multitude of ways a company can go about that. The labeling, the presentation, having actual salesmen that get a pay to living wage, like, you know, those kinds of things. Like, I just can't condone this MLM business model. Still, that's what they went with. And that's why we're here. However, before we get into their sellers, their basket shaped building and their downfall, let's talk about what Longa Burger was selling. While researching the topic, I saw the word collectible show up quite a few times and a lot more than normal when I'm researching something. And personally, when I hear the word collectible, I think about something that's going to increase in value over time. I'm not saying that this is true of everything, hence the whole Beanie Baby collection situation, but there's something questionable about these baskets being marketed as collectibles. Are these baskets really worth as much as they're sold for? Was collectibles just a word tossed around to get people to hoard the products? Well, I dug a little deeper to try and find out. 
Some of these so-called collectible baskets sell around $60, while I've seen others on eBay going from anywhere between 10 to well over $100. And while I obviously don't consider myself to be the target market here, there's clearly a market for it somewhere because someone has to be buying it. I started investigating how much of a collectible these baskets can really be. And according to the collectibles database, it seems to depend on the item specifically. For example, their pottery doesn't seem to be considered all that valuable, whereas the baskets are still up for debate. Now, when it comes to their pottery, the website states, most Longaburger pottery is pretty easy to spot because of the distinct basket we've designed, traditionally located around the center of the item or around the edges. The woven traditions four petal motive can be found on the original classic blue, traditional red, and heritage green pieces. All Longaburger pottery is either embossed with the woven L logo, Longaburger name, or decal. Pottery that does not include these attributes are not authentic Longaburger. Several different embossed logo and logo decals have been used throughout the years. Contrary to popular belief, pottery that does not meet Longaburger's stringent quality standards are not more collectible or worth more than the first quality products. So as I understand it, even though Longaburger specialized in baskets, they did branch out to a few other items. This pottery was made in the Friendship Pottery in Roseville, Ohio between 1990 to 1991 and is now known as their Roseville Pottery Collection. In 1992, Longaburger moved production to Hall China Company and Sterling China Company of East Liverpool, Ohio. Then in 2002, Flatscraft Pottery in Thomasville, Pennsylvania joined in their production, adding solid color pottery to the collections. Longaburger began introducing new styles and calling them proudly American and American craft original. However, Longaburger had strict quality standards that these small individual suppliers just couldn't keep up with. In 2005, when Flatscraft closed, Longaburger outsourced their pottery from China. Even though they could offer more pieces this way, a lot of their collectors were upset by this and refused to buy anything not made in the US. Longaburger backtracked the following year and began bringing pottery production back to the States. According to Collectibles Database, As a major step in what they referred to as Project Eagle effort to move onto an all US made line, Longaburger invested into a 300,000 square foot facility for Longaburger Pottery Works located at Niagara Ceramics in Buffalo, New York. A ribbon cutting ceremony was held on May 20th, 2013. This move to bring the pottery production home continues the remarkable tradition of offering unique handcrafted American made products to the world. Their pottery is handcrafted, made in the USA and incredibly expensive at almost $100 for a three-piece dinnerware set, just two plates and a bowl. If you're really into pottery though, maybe it's worth it to you. Granted, the Longaburger of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s is not the same Longaburger of today since they went defunct and they were bought out, but more on that later. As for the baskets, well, you can make some decent money selling old Longa burgers, but others argue that it's incredibly subjective. For example, one writer on Collectibles Database, Jill Bentley, claims that her sister sold 40 baskets on eBay and made over $1,500 in total. Though very few collectors are looking to buy a huge collection at once, if you have the pieces they're looking for, it could potentially be profitable. So from this aspect, yes, the baskets could be considered collector's items. On the other hand, professional appraiser Helene Fendelman, who has written about Longaburger for Country Living Magazine, said differently in 2018. The resale market for Longaburger baskets is at the garage sale level at the moment, Fendelman said. With that said, if a basket sold for $100, $150, what will it sell for at a tag sale? Maybe $20, $25, or someone who doesn't know or doesn't care may take $10 or less. As the company went under and before it was revived, however, people began to wonder if these baskets would increase in value. After all, if Longaburger wasn't Longaburger anymore, wouldn't people want these collectible items that they couldn't get anywhere else? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It sure seemed that way. This is an opportunity for even the museums and galleries in Columbus to collect the baskets. It's part of the history of the era after all, Fendelman said. The market will likely be low until collectors begin hoarding, collecting, promoting the pieces. I've been in the business for 40 years and I know that markets change, Fendelman said. If I knew what was going to be hot in the next few weeks, I would be out buying it. Fendelman's advice is simply to buy what you love, regardless of potential collectible status. And of course, to not put all your eggs in one basket. Now, obviously I'm not a woven basket expert. I'm also not the target market here, but collectible items are never a guarantee. As for their items today, yes, I would say that they're pretty pricey woven baskets. There's been a number of complaints about the company failing to ship orders as well, though most of these were around the time that they closed. But enough about expensive baskets. What the hell happened to Longaburger? Last we left off, fancy American-made wicker was all the rage. So what went wrong? Well, let's get back to this Longaburger timeline and get your popcorn if you haven't already, because this one's gonna be a bit more dramatic than I ever thought a basket weaving company was capable of. (music) 
Whether or not it's one I agree with, Dave Longaberger built a legacy nonetheless. By 1984, Dave's daughter, Tammy, joined the company. His other daughter, Rachel, joined the family business as well, though this source doesn't specify when. Within a few years, they not only had over 400 employees, but a sales associate in every state. Tammy became president in 1994, but her father remained a chairman. Then in 1995, they opened up a 120,000 square foot Longaberger Woods Craft facility, an 880,000 square foot manufacturing facility, a Longaberger Family Center daycare facility for employees' children, and a seven story, 180,000 square foot basket shaped headquarters. Quarters. Yes, you heard me right. They had a headquarters that is the shape of a basket. Plus the Longaberger homestead is also home to the world's largest apple basket measuring 29 feet tall. The company became an absolute icon reaching thousands of employees and hundreds of millions in sales. This basket building too became a massive icon in of itself. According to Atlas Obscura, it opened in 1997 and a lot of the cherry wood used in its construction came from the Longaberger golf club itself. It also has two handles that can even be heated in the winter to thaw ice, which is just wild. Jim Klein, a former president has stated, the basket is a symbol of overcoming adversity of what you can achieve, adding that he and his son, like Longaberger himself, have dyslexia. Hey, ditto. The inside is described as surprisingly stately and honestly, based on the photos, I can't say I entirely disagree with that. At least it doesn't look like you're inside, you know, a giant basket. Anyway, for quite some time, Longaberger could do no wrong. Even though they were an MLM, they appeared to be on the less controversial side of things, such as Sensi or Color Street. Personally, I believe this is because with objects such as candles, nail art, and baskets, you're generally at pretty low risk of physically harming someone with your product. Whereas when you look at other companies like, oh, I don't know, Herbalife, Unique, Rodin and Fields and Young Living, since you're ingesting an item, putting it on your skin or making health claims, people might be a bit warier of what's in them and their bodies may react quite negatively. Then again, perhaps I spoke too soon. There actually is one case where a Longaberger basket may have killed an infant. According to the lawsuit, Michael Patrick Malloy was born April 6, 1984, several weeks premature. On April 12, 1984, he was discharged from the hospital and appellants received custody of him through a private adoption. On April 21st, 1984, nine days later, Michael Patrick Malloy died. During the last two days of his life, the baby exhibited signs of lethargy and a reluctance to eat. The coroner's office at first listed the cause of death as sudden infant death syndrome. In an effort to find a more specific cause of death, appellants took the basket, samples of food, and some of the baby's toys to the coroner's office. The coroner immediately noticed a strong smell coming from the basket that irritated his eyes and ordered testing of the basket and of the tissue samples taken from the baby. Following further toxicological and pathological testing, the coroner concluded that Michael Patrick Malloy died of cardiopulmonary arrest due to, or as a consequence of toxic effects of solvent benzene homologous. That is, in the coroner's opinion, the infant died from inhaling fumes from toxic chemicals in the stain applied to his cradle. If those paint fumes were enough to potentially kill an infant, is it even safe to have that basket in your home in the first place, even if not at crib? Olympic Paint Company, which Longaberger works with, claimed to have no knowledge that their paint was harmful and no previous complaints such as this. From what I can tell, the parents lost the lawsuit, though news outlets at the time cited the parents' coroner's report. Even reviews on Longaberger's book to this day will mention the lawsuit, claiming that they were legally outgunned and the company was heartless. From what I can tell, the court of public opinion believes that the fumes killed the child, though the court itself states differently. Aside from this, however, Longaberger seemed to be a fantastic company in the eyes of many. Around the same time that this basket building was built, the vice president of corporate affairs, Mike Bennett, claimed that Dave Longaberger himself had an unwritten rule, that 25% of the workday should be dedicated to having fun. And he said that it keeps the atmosphere relaxed, professional, and creative. They sold 7 million baskets in 1996, taking in over half a billion dollars. And in 1998, the first full year occupying the basket-shaped building, they began using a computerized forecasting system to predict and manage their growth. Things were looking up, building on themselves, and then almost out of nowhere, the entire company was turned on its head and changed for the worse. In 1999, Dave Longaberger died of kidney cancer. The New York Times spoke well of Dave when he passed. They mentioned that even since the age of six, when he got a job stocking grocery shelves, I have no idea how he could have possibly reached the top shelves, that he demonstrated a certain tenacity. 
Dave also had a severe stutter and suffered from epilepsy, but he continued to persevere and had to repeat some grades three times until he graduated high school at 21. According to the New York Times article, Dave essentially turned Dredson into a Longaburger town, complete with Longaburger restaurants, shops, and a Longaburger museum. He gave away millions of dollars, restored Dresden buildings, and attracted tourists from far and wide to his basket building. After his cancer diagnosis, Tammy became the president and his other daughter, Rachel, was in charge of the family foundation. Much of the time during these episodes, the founders of MLMs are often malicious. They'll know that the business model will lose money and they just don't care and they continue on with it because the company is all about money for them. When I reference this point, I usually take a look at founders such as Mark Hughes of Herbalife who lied about and used his own mother's death to promote his company. Carl Draker of Beachbody is notorious for using any manipulative sales tactic necessary to get some on board, and Young Living founder Gary Young killed his own child. Well, allegedly, all of it's alleged, but if you go read the articles around that time, it's messy. I I have a whole video on it on the YouTube channel. It's a mess. But Longaberger, I really have a lot of trouble disliking him. Quite frankly, he reminds me of the founder of Color Street, Naive for employing the business model, absolutely, but he seemed to be genuinely passionate about what he was doing, which sometimes makes these episodes quite difficult to critique the company because the founder just seems so dang nice. On the other hand, I could be very wrong. There's the distinct possibility that he gave away those millions for appearances sake only, that the baby really did die from paint fumes and his company and the paint company weren't held responsible and that baskets were really just about money for him. But from what I've gathered thus far, Dave was looking at popular companies in the 70s such as Tupperware and Amway and mistakenly believed that this was the future and this was a fantastic way to tell his company's story. There may be far more malicious intent than that I'm just missing here, but I also don't want to exaggerate anything here and make Dave out to be worse than what I think he actually was. And as it turns out, no matter what you may think of Dave, the company did rely on him. Dave had a vision for the company moving forward. One former employer, Wild, who worked in research and development said that it was the death of Dave that became the death of the company. According to Columbus Monthly, he said, a lot of people may not want to hear that, but that's my opinion. He mentions a 20 page letter David wrote just before he died in which he outlined a plan to transform the company, moving beyond baskets. His plan was we would be giving baskets away to people who we'd build a house for, who we'd build furniture for, Wide says. Baskets would kind of fade out as far as selling them in the market. I don't know how he knew that, but he knew it. Aside from Dave being the company's visionary founder, he was still their leader. Robert Shook, the ghostwriter for Mary Kay Ash's best-selling autobiography, had also interviewed Dave for his own biography, Longaburger, an American success story, that was released after Dave passed away. Robert Shook claims that Longaburger, just like Mary Kay, was a company that lived and died on the charisma of its founders, namely because their dynamic personalities inspire a cult-like following, one that we often see in direct sales. Maybe it wasn't that Tammy was so bad, says Shook, He was just so good at that role and he wasn't replaceable. And that's where I'm going to disagree with Robert. Tammy was horrible at Longaburger without her father. There were some elements that were beyond her control, such as the economy taking after the 9-11 and styles changing in general. Even so, once Dave died, the business began to struggle. Columbus Monthly states that Tammy pushed pottery lines overseas, compromising their made in America values and changed the company's compensation plan. Executive turnover meant that the company bounced between ideas with little consistency and in the span of five years, they went through four presidents. A former employee recalls Tammy spending much of her time in the early 2000s buying property and focusing on the homestead, a Longaburger owned old fashioned shopping district outside of Dresden that her father hoped would grow into a Disneyland like attraction when she probably should have concentrated on the core business. She had the potential to be a good leader, but she had a lot of things going on around her that distracted her, the former employee recalls. All the while, Tammy herself was living large in a 57,000 square foot mansion in Ohio. Her 200 acre Nashport estate also boasted a pool, horse barn, helicopter pad, and a six car garage. And the company simply couldn't support this lifestyle of hers. Companies were being laid off left and right, and Tammy had no choice but to sell the estate in 2015 for $6 million, 9 million below her asking price. Tammy tried to take a page out of her father's book, quite literally, by writing her own memoir, but shifting the love and attention off of her father as a central inspiration figure of Longaburger was no easy feat. See, it wasn't just the basket building that was an icon to the Longaburger name, but Dave himself. Stories about him are still told in that article, his little idiosyncrasies that employees remember. He apparently dropped his pants at a roast in his honor to expose a pair of heart covered boxers, claimed his cane was made out of a bull's genitals and had an odd aversion to shaking hands. He was simply put a character. 
Whereas Tammy, on the other hand, explained that she didn't even have the time to grieve. After her father passed away, she claims that, quote, I could barely find my footing, much less think of the visionary Longeberger needed me to be as we embarked on this new chapter in our short history, end quote. By 2013, the company was in dire straits. Joan Rochon, a former Mary Kay executive known as the direct selling turnaround specialist, was looking for assets to buy for his new holding company, CVSL, later renamed to JRJR Networks. JRJR absorbed Longeberger, vowing to honor the former owners. Rochon stated in 2013 that Longeberger will forever be Longeberger. Tammy is the leader and her daughter will lead it next. Tammy's daughter, Claire, by the way, she even joined the company in 2012 after graduating from Ohio State University. So all's well that ends well, right? JRJR absorbed this MLM and we can leave the episode while saying that I don't support any MLMs, at least this one doesn't leave such a foul taste in my mouth. Well, unfortunately, no. Because while Rashawn said Longeberger will always be Longeberger, apparently someone didn't agree with him, Tammy herself. And when we return after the sponsor break, we're gonna go through how the company was quite literally ripped apart. Thanks to Avast One for sponsoring this episode. So some of us are still working from home right now without much virus protection, even as we hear about new cyber attacks all the time. So we should have a serious think about our online security. Luckily, there's Avast One to make protecting yourself a little bit easier. Avast has been a global leader in cybersecurity for more than 30 years and is trusted by over 435 million users. Avast One's award-winning antivirus stops viruses and malware from harming your devices. They provide ransomware protection that secures your personal photos, documents, and other files from being modified, deleted, or encrypted by ransomware attacks. Plus, they provide firewall protection so you can keep personal information secure and prevent attacks that seek to access your computers and steal your data. I've said it before and I've said it again. I like that Avast just runs in the background, it does its thing, and once it's up and running, I don't have to worry about it anymore because there's already a lot on my plate and I'm sure there's a lot on yours too, so Avast One makes it easy to stay protected and stay low key and out of your hair. Avast prevents over 1.5 billion attacks every month, and with Avast One, you can confidently take control of your online world without worrying about viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, or other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. We're all obsessed with sleep lately because no one's getting any. There's so many products out there to help, but the truth of the matter is it doesn't matter how many mattress toppers or heavy blankets you get on it. If you've got a bad mattress, your sleep is gonna be bad too. But seriously, it's gonna be fine because there's Purple Mattress. Only Purple Mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid, It's super stretchy, magical, squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points without retaining heat. And I am someone who sleeps very hot. Despite the fact that I also need a weighted blanket at all times, I am also someone who overheats at night. So sleeping on a bed and having pillows made by purple that are just breathable and allow everything to stay cool, it really, really helps with that night of sleep that I so desperately need. And the gel flex grid, it's kind of a wonder. It's weird as hell at first and it's really heavy. I should probably like let you know, this thing is heavy, but it is incredible. It supports your back and legs and it also feels cushiony on your shoulders, neck and hips. It's basically comfy in all the places you need and support where you need it. Getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. Get a purple mattress. Go to purple.com slash MLM and use code MLM. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash MLM. Use code MLM for 10% off any order of $200 or more. Purple.com slash MLM, promo code MLM. Terms apply. In 2015, Tammy left the company under confusing circumstances. SEC filings indicate that she was actually fired after she attempted to resign, though the exact reason is still unclear to this day. John Vershone Jr. said that Tammy tried, we tried, it didn't work and someone had to step in and make sure that the sales force was taken care of when he took over her position as CEO. Tammy's daughter, as well as sister Rachel, also left the company around the same time. So much for Longaburger forever being Longaburger. In fact, not only did Tammy leave the company, but she actually sued JRJR for over a million dollars. Also remember that their name used to be CVSL apparently, and they hadn't changed it yet when this article was written. So just know that, that the name it's the same company. Among the charges she leveled was that CVSL had reduced her salary of $850,000 per year by $600,000 during a four month deferral period that was never made up and caused Longaburger Co. to fail to pay sales and use taxes to several states. 
prompting these state taxing authorities to seek to assess me personally. CVSL responded by saying it had terminated Longaberger after an internal investigation revealed that she engaged in substantial misconduct that had damaged the Longaberger Co. and CVSL. Longaberger later said she was saddened that the people brought in to help lift the Longaberger Co. up have chosen instead to try and tear me down. CVSL's charges were a transparent attempt to evade their responsibilities under my contract, she said, adding that CVSL had chosen to spin innuendo and false charges to justify their default. This became, for lack of a better term, a circus. CVSL slash JRJR pointed the finger at Tammy saying she engaged in shady behavior, while Tammy pointed the finger at JRJR for breaking their contract. Apparently, when JRJR bought Longaberger, Tammy didn't make JRJR aware that Longaberger had made a tax increment financing agreement with Newark on May 1st, 1996 for $4.1 million. As of 2016, at the time the suit was filed, Longaberger still owed over half a million dollars to various local taxing entities. JRJR demanded that Tammy pay this massive liability or release JRJR networks from its obligations because she didn't disclose this year's prior. They also stated that Tammy had an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate executive and that her lengthy absences from the company's home office became so frequent and egregious that she made herself an absentee CEO. Former employees dubbed this whole drama as the basket turns and the image of Longaberger in general plummeted. I can tell people that Longaberger at its height was like visiting Disney World or Cedar Point on July 4th weekend, says Jay Hottinger, a longtime state legislator from Newark. Now it's more like Chevy Chase visiting Wally World. Rachel Longaberger too sued the company, stating that they owed her $4 million that they'd promised her in 2013. Longaberger was drowning in litigation, not making the sales they once did, and Dresden, to say the least, handled the decline poorly. Longaberger was its longstanding corporate benefactor, and in 2017, there were vacant lots, shuttered businesses, and abandoned buildings. The place was practically a company town, and it became more of a ghost town soon. The basket-shaped building itself also began falling apart. Its wooden deck rotted, scraps of laminate fell off of it, and the Longaberger Museum and restaurant both closed. Longaberger folded in on itself. JRJR vacated the famed basket building in 2016 and obviously struggled to sell it. You'd have to really love baskets to buy that. Eventually, a Canton-based developer, Steve Kuhn, did buy it in 2017, but only for $1.2 million, just over a fifth of what JRJR was asking for. At least Kuhn Restoration promised that they wouldn't take the handles off and intended to keep it as a basket. This $1.2 million only just barely covered the more than $800,000 owed in property taxes that JRJR had fallen behind on. That was certainly a massive blow. Tammy and Rachel's lawsuits also made things even worse when the judgment against JRJR resulted in $4.85 million. By the time the New York Stock Exchange suspended trading of JRJR shares and the two of their other companies were shuttered, the writing was on the wall. Longaberger was no more. Unfortunately for the sellers, they didn't exactly handle that well either. This is where most of the Longaberger complaints come in. See, even though Longaberger wasn't making nearly the amount of money they were used to, they were still a multi-million dollar company. As such, they were still getting orders. Yet rather than refund these people, they essentially just took the money and ran. One sales consultant, Joanne Mancinelli, traveled to Dresden from Pittsburgh over two hours when the company promised they'd reopen one of their Longaberger patio shops in late May. She, along with multiple other sellers, hoped to purchase baskets simply to fulfill their lingering orders. Yet the shop was closed, just like the rest of the company's operations. For many, it's the legacy of what used to be that brings back fond memories of Longaberger. More than 600 people lined up to see the first ever public tour of the basket building in 2019 since it went defunct. The executive director of Heritage Ohio said that people were in tears and hugging each other. Many of the former employees had nothing but good things to say, at least when Dave was running the business. The Weavers at least had good work and good benefits. The former design director, Howard Peller, remembered it as a beehive and he continues weaving willow sticks into baskets and using the plant to create living fences and other structures to this day. Southeast Ohio Magazine says the practice of basket weaving has largely been forgotten, but Southeast Ohio itself remains rooted in rich artisan tradition. The article also adds that many do want to see the Longaberger name revived and well, they did get their wish. The Longaberger name did kind of live on, even if it's not exactly the company that it once was under Dave Longaberger himself. Rachel Longaberger relaunched her family's baskets on the QVC Home Shopping Channel. 
About 20 former Longaberger workers started making the baskets in July, 2019 in the company's Dresden factory. Although the famous basket building was actually going to become a hotel in 2020, COVID sort of ruined that. As of January, 2021, the building is actually back on the market. So if any of you have $6.5 million laying around and have a basket obsession, this might be the building for you. But for now, before we end today's episode, we're going to go over just a few numbers and a few thoughts that I have about this from the MLM perspective. And the first is, could you have actually made money selling Longa Burger? Chances are slim, actually. You may be making a 25% commission, but even then you would have to have an incredibly extensive network of people that are very much into buying expensive baskets. Though I wasn't able to find their income disclosures, given the statistics we know generally speaking about MLMs and how over 99% of participants lose money, I think it's pretty safe to assume that Longa Burger is exactly the same way. Even if you somehow did manage to sell hundreds and hundreds of baskets a year to get that commission, once you take out self-employment taxes, the cost of basket parties you'd wanna throw and the time to plan those parties, it's just not viable. Truly, I'm incredibly disappointed that even when Longa Burger relaunched on QVC, they said they would keep the business model. I can't say I'm surprised, but it is a little disheartening to see that even still, this is a component they wanted to keep. Although the employees and weavers were treated well, as far as we know, the direct sellers weren't. The moment the company closed, we saw that with many of them complaining that the company they'd worked for and believed in simply left them with unfulfilled orders, standing outside a closed shop, wondering where their baskets went. I don't know what would have happened if this happened under Dave himself, but the fact that there's obviously no real recourse for these sellers speaks volumes about how Longa Burger's business model thought about their sellers, which isn't much thought at all. But hey, all of this is just my opinion. So with that being said, I'd love to know yours. Did you enjoy today's episode? Did you learn something new? Let me know. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. If you liked it, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing. If you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, please make sure to go to my Linktree link. I try and keep that updated with all social media that I'm on right now, projects I'm involved in, all the good stuff. So thank you so much for hanging out with me today and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.